Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Clinical Care Commission virtual meeting. I'm Jennifer Gillison from Hoffman and Associates, and we'll help you as be your facilitator today. I'd like to start explaining a little bit about the webinar interface. You should see the first slide of the PowerPoint presentation in the middle of the screen, and the Q&A and chat boxes to the right of the slide. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A box that will be addressed at a later date. If you have any technical issues, please be sure to put it in a chat box and someone will be able to address your concerns. Now I'll turn it over to Linda Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually going to turn it over to Claudette Powell first. Good afternoon and, and good morning to some of our listeners. Uh, this is Dr. Clyde S. Powell, medical officer in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services based here in the Washington, D.C. area. I'd like to welcome everyone on the phone uh, to our fourth uh, meeting of the National Clinical Care Commission. This is the second virtual meeting. I want to welcome all our members as well as the listening public. Um, we're delighted with your participation and interest in this important topic. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, as of late August, because of the increasing responsibilities of the National Clinical Care Commission, Dr. Don Wright has made the decision to transition the role of the designated federal officer from myself to Dr. Linda Harris, and um, my role, my new role in the National Clinical Care Commission will be as the technical lead. Dr. Harris and I have worked closely together over these last four years, and we will continue to do that as we transition the responsibilities and various activities, but I will continue to be um, actively engaged within the commission. So I'm officially calling this meeting to order and now handing this back over to our new designated federal officer, Dr. Linda Harris. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. This is Linda Harris. I am the uh, new uh, designated federal officer. I'm a senior public health office uh, advisor in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion and a colleague of uh, Dr. Powell. I'm now going to do a roll call for the record. Uh, William Herman. I am here. Anne Albright. Yes, here. Howard Tracer. Here. Terry Mark. Here. Naomi Fuagawa. Here. Donald Sell. Here. William Chong. I'm here. Aaron Lapata. I'm here. And Bullock? Here. And Barbara Linder? Here. David Wong? Here. And Lynn Hogarth of uh, here. Indian Paul Conlon? Here. Ayo Yatunde Jakun. Is that the way you pronounce your name? Uh, close enough. Ayatunde. Ayatunde. Ayatunde Doku. Okay. Great. Carol Greentree? Greenlee? Carol. Yeah, Greenlee, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I should know your name by now. Uh, David Strogat? Here. Dean Schillinger? I'm here. Ellen Leakey? Leakey or Leak? Ellen? Helen, are you there? I'll come back. Uh, Jasmine Gonzalo? Yeah. Gonzalo. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. John Boltry? Here. Uh, Meredith Hawkins is on personal leave, uh, so she will not be here today. Uh, Shannon Isaac? Shannon Isaac, here. Isaac, Isaac, thank you. Thank you. Sharon Bowen? Here. Bill Cook? Here. And I'm going back to Ellen Lee. All right, we had her on the phone earlier. Yeah, Ellen, do you have your phone muted?
right, we will send an email, and for the moment, I will um, turn this over to um, Dr. Herman. Good. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm really impressed that we, we've gotten everyone on this call. I want to thank all of the members of the commission for making themselves available. I uh, also want to welcome uh, members of the public who might be uh, calling in for our deliberation. Um, we have a full agenda today. We're going to start with a quick update on the status of the data call. We're going to then have presentation of two models that we might use to organize the recommendations of the commission. We're going to then have reports from the prevention, general population, prevention, targeted population. Both to review their focus areas, discuss the focus areas among the larger commission, and then try to see how they might fit into the socio-ecological and expanded chronic care models and have a discussion as to whether those models are really appropriate to organize our recommendation. After that, we'll have a break and uh, public comments. And then following that, we'll have an open discussion of next steps, including any issues that come up related to the data call, but more specifically, the, the models as well as how our focus areas might fit into those models. After that, then, we'll want to look at uh, next steps in terms of uh, generating the data we need to move forward uh, with our recommendation. So that's a brief summary of the agenda. Um, I'd like to turn it back to Claudette Powell now, who will give us a full update on the data call. Great. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Are you all able to hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. To uh, lay the foundation for today's update on the data call, it's important to refresh our memories about the purpose of the data call, which was conceptualized broadly by the National Clinical Care Commission at its inaugural meeting. Um, according to the Public Law 115-80, the National Clinical Care Act, which contains the charter, um, the NCC is charged by Congress to evaluate and make recommendations to the Secretary of Health and to Congress regarding five key areas. And I'd like to just uh, briefly go over them so that we can uh, all be on the same level here. Um, the first key area is for the National Clinical Care Commission to evaluate federal programs that focus on preventing and reducing the incidence of diabetes that represent a significant disease burden in the U.S., including complications from diabetes. <laughs> Secondly, to evaluate and make recommendations on current activities and gaps in federal efforts to support clinicians in providing integrated, high-quality care to individuals with diabetes and its complications. Thirdly, to, to make uh, to evaluate and make recommendations on improvements in and improved coordination of federal education and awareness activities related to the prevention and treatment of diabetes and its complications, which may include utilization of new and existing technologies. Fourthly, to evaluate methods for outreach and dissemination of education and awareness materials that, number one, address the disease and its complications, number two, are funded by the federal government, and number three, are intended for healthcare professionals and the public. And lastly, to evaluate and make recommendations as to whether there are opportunities for consolidation of inappropriately overlapping or duplicative federal programs related to diabetes and its complications. So with that foundation, I first of all want to thank, make a public thanks to all the National Clinical Care members as individuals and as subcommittee members who over the many months have provided both initial and ongoing input to the data call tools or the questionnaire set. My thanks to those who have reviewed, commented, edited, provided improvements, as well as provided supporting references. 
Secondly, our thanks to the smaller team who worked to help tear down these tools and to focus on the essential components of the data, data call tool. The tool or tools that have emerged after this interim process are two. Firstly, a, about a 13-page questionnaire that explores the policies and programs of federal agencies that provide direct clinical services or which guide and support those services. Smaller tool, about a three-page questionnaire that explores policies and programs of, that work in the larger context of population well-being. Agencies that are non-clinical but health-related, such as agriculture, education, transportation, housing, which contribute to the well-being of the American population and to, and thereby to those who are at risk for diabetes by virtue of social factors, environmental conditions, etc. The National Clinical Care Commission has provided, at Dr. Don Wright's request, further background information on the Commission's rationale for the data call to non-HHS federal agencies beyond USDA, Department of Defense, and the Veterans Administration. Those tools are under review by Dr. Wright, who is the Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion and also the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health. Once his review is completed, and approval is granted with any indicated changes in the data call pool, that data call will be sent out by the Secretary of Health. It is anticipated that the completion of the data call by relevant federal agencies will take anywhere from two to three months um, with some <clears throat> flexibility in that. The National Clinical Care Commission will then use those data to formulate its findings and recommendations which are due to Congress and the Secretary of Health by October 2021. So that is a recap uh, on the data call. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Can I, can I ask a question? Is it our questions allowed, I guess? Certainly, Dean. Dr. Schillinger. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify the, um, the review that uh, Dr. Wright is doing now uh, with respect to the to the data call, is that um, specific to the, to the scope of work of the commission that relates to the data call, or is it an overarching um, assessment of the scope of work of the commission in general? Uh, I would say, Dr. Schillinger, that it's the latter. Okay. And when do we expect to hear um, the outcome of that uh, assessment? I'm hoping early next month. Or early October or early November? Early October. Okay. Uh, Dr. Powell, this is Bill Herman. Uh, my understanding is that both of the data calls would go out at the same time, that neither will go out until the, the approval process is complete for both. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That is Dr. Wright's uh, desire, and uh, that is our intention to comply with that. Okay. And um, and I guess the all right that that's fine. Good. Any other questions or or thoughts about this? Good. Okay. Um, so the next topic then was uh, the presentation of the two models that we might use to organize the recommendations of the commission. And we have the socio-ecological and expanded chronic care models. Uh, Dean Schillinger will be presenting the, uh, the socio-ecological model, and then Ann Bullock will be presenting the uh, extended chronic care model. So Dean, do you want to go ahead with your presentation then? Sure. Yeah, I was going to take a stab at both uh, models, and Anne was going to comment a, a, along the way. Okay. And and again, as as we go through this, I want people to think about what focus areas or recommendations they think might come from the commission, and how well they might fit into this uh, theoretical structure. Whether these models adequately address the recommendations that we might want to make at the end of the day. 
Thank you, Bill. So, um, yes, I was asked to present um, sort of two conceptual frameworks that uh, have been developed that we, I think, have the opportunity as part of this commission to uh, both adapt for our needs as well as integrate uh, with each other to help kind of resolve both tension and opportunity that is presented to us to think about um, uh, the prevention and control of diabetes as it relates to uh, government agency functions in a uh, novel and impactful way. Uh, to date, I think the world of um, uh, population health and uh, clinical care um, have been relatively siloed, um, despite the fact that we know that these are uh, intimately interrelated. And uh, so uh, this presentation is an attempt to present um, very simplified versions of two conceptual models that have been uh, popularized in various forms and validated in various forms uh, so that we can think about how best to integrate them and how best to have our individual subcommittee work uh, fit into these models. And uh, I will just say up front that these models are not comprehensive. We're providing a simplified version. So if you don't see a particular issue uh, of concern uh, of your subcommittee on there, that's okay. That's an opportunity, and we, we want to hear about that, and we want to think about how, how best to integrate uh, that. So this is simply an, sort of an introductory uh, set of uh, slides to um, instigate conversation and to develop um, the beginning of uh, a discussion of whether we want to adopt these, adapt these models and synthesize them in some way. So um, the first model, um, many of you are familiar with, but just I think it was uh, the Hoover called to briefly review, and there are about 20,000 different versions of this model available online. Um, we selected the one um, that we felt was um, most straightforward and inclusive and specific to uh, diabetes risk. Um, there, there are some problems with this model, but I think um, the benefits outweigh the risk. So the idea here is that um, uh, while all uh, factors um, ultimately uh, play out the level of the individual, how the individual's behavior is shaped and how uh, their lived experience is embodied um, depend in very large part on factors around them as individuals. So not just those that are either predetermined by genetics or self-determined based on cognitive uh, desires to behave or act a particular way. Uh, we know that these factors that I will present to you uh, uh, determine uh, in the general population between 70 to 90 percent of health outcomes and health status. In the case of diabetes specifically, this has not, to my knowledge, been specifically studied, but I would estimate that for an individual with pre-diabetes who is at risk of developing diabetes, that proportion is, um, is likely to relate directly to the progression to diabetes. In other words, the impact of clinical care, by and large, for the progression of, of patients from prediabetes to diabetes is largely influenced by their behaviors that are shaped by uh, the circles around them that I will discuss in a minute. In the case of type 2 diabetes where an individual already has the disease, obviously the interaction with um, the healthcare system is more important, um, but nonetheless, it is likely that determinants of outcomes for that patient's diabetes with respect to metabolic control and complication rates likely uh, rest predominantly in uh, the socioecological uh, conditions in which they reside, although the healthcare system effects are obviously much greater in that patient, maybe around 40 to 50 percent um, in terms of determining outcomes. So for people with prediabetes, Social and environmental factors are extremely important for people with existing diabetes. They too are important, and the impact of the healthcare system is increasingly important for those with type 2 diabetes. Hence, the need to review both uh, conceptual models. So, the first model I will describe um, is a socio-ecological model that you see in front of you. Uh, I think uh, starting at the very smallest circle, we have individual factors attributes of the individual themselves that will determine um, the kind
kinds of food and beverage intake and quality that they um, that they have across their life course. Similarly, individual factors uh, such as I want to join a gym, I want to join the YMCA pre-diabetes um, program, I want to uh, walk every day for 30 minutes, all of those individual factors and decisions will affect their level of physical activity. In addition, and not displayed here, there are individual factors that will impact other significant uh, risk factor for uh, development and progression of diabetes, which is uh, stress and uh, toxic stress in particular, um, which should be uh, its own uh, ellipse. Uh, next, side by side with food and beverage, physical activity should be stressed. These, in turn, um, both affect energy intake and energy expenditure, but more importantly, and not displayed here, uh, is an equation that goes beyond energy balance, which is uh, metabolic dysfunction in general. And there is evidence that um, physical activity, stress, and dietary quality affect metabolic function beyond uh, the simple equation of uh, calories in, calories out. So those are the two critiques I have so far of this socio-ecological model. Um, if we move up, the individual um, is uh, significantly impacted by the settings in which they work, play, pray, uh, etc. The, the places in which we live our lives. And so these settings include um, community settings, the places we work, uh, the characteristics of the healthcare system, where we learn, uh, so schools and childcare, and um, the conditions of our home. These all are extremely strong determinants of whether or not we experience stress, whether or not we engage in physical activity, and whether or not we as individuals uh, consume healthy food and, be and beverages. In turn, these behavioral settings are, uh, and, the, and their characteristics, are heavily influenced and a function of a number of sectors of influence. Um, these are listed in the bubble on the right. They include um, policies uh, at the governmental level, at the public health level, uh, at the healthcare level, uh, policies and practices uh, um, that determine um, our, ag our agricultural system, our educational system, uh, that affect um, what we are exposed to and learn from our media, how zoning, land use uh, decisions uh, impact uh, the, the retail um, uh, and food environment and uh, the ability to uh, physically uh, be physically active. Similarly, uh, how our transportation systems are or are not set up will significantly influence how we uh, come and go and the degree of physical activity that we engage in and the stress we experience from that. Um, community, uh, communities themselves and the practices and policies that they um, uh, engage in are an important sector of influence that can uh, uh, impact uh, behavioral settings and individual factors. Uh, foundations and, and their role in uh, influencing um, resources and uh, uh, focus areas for community development are important, as well as the practices and standards of uh, major industries uh, in our country, specifically the food and beverage industry, uh, the restaurant and food retail industries, uh, those entities that um, uh, advance uh, physical activity, uh, leisure and recreation, and entertainment. Uh, that's the second most outer circle. And finally, the, the, the outermost circle, and some people actually put this before the sectors of influence, but nonetheless, are the uh, social norms and values that obviously have a reciprocal relationship with the sectors of influence, but the general social norms and values uh, related to uh, the issues of food and beverage intake, physical activity, uh, stress, and social uh, equity um, all influence the other sectors and the other spheres that ultimately uh, trickle down to the individual, uh, to their individual choices and individual behaviors. So that is a kind of a rarefied version of uh, the socio-ecological model. There are a number of uh, models that have been um, adapted uh, to, for example, better represent uh, the socio-ecological model uh, in Indian country um, and how uh, historical uh, oppression and stress uh, and
and trauma have impacted um, the diabetes epidemic. Others that have uh, looked at, at children in specific. But I think this is the broadest uh, and, and most specific one that I could find, uh, with the only caveat being energy balance as being uh, misrepresented as the only uh, important outcome here as opposed to metabolic dysregulation. And um, the other critique being that stress and trauma are not um, included. Let me stop there, um, and just before I say that, we're going to go to the chronic care model that has a, a, a number of, of uh, overlap areas that I think are relevant. Uh, but but before before I go there, sorry, do, do we want to take um, questions or comments on uh, yeah, Bill on, on this model? Yeah, yeah let's see. And, and actually, I wanted to start with just uh, perhaps an extension at the individual factor level. I know this is a socio-ecological model. But certainly genetics, epigenetics, more basic would, would be at that level too beyond food and beverage intake, physical activity, and stress, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, I failed to highlight the bubbles that are, are noted under individual factors. Um, a gene environment interaction, in particular, the research on genetics and type 2 diabetes is quite weak, but um, specifically around epigenetics how genes and the environment interact to determine which genes get expressed is a potentially very important area of future research. We, we don't know a lot yet, but I think it will enable us to get out of the dichotomy uh, that we've been stuck in regarding genes versus environment uh, in the next decade or so. Other questions? Yeah, it's Carol. And I think the thing is what Bill said is uh, data cell capacity. <laughs> of the individual, which can be uh, altered by you know, metabolic factors, but also there can be ethnic and gen genetic impact on person's beta cell capacity, which is goes beyond just the obesity um, issue, Absolutely. in addition to the obesity issue. Absolutely. So we know that different ethnic groups, for example, um, may acquire diabetes at lower body mass indexes, indices than, uh, than other ethnic groups. Whether or not that is a fixed characteristic of the person's beta cell capacity or whether that is a function of gene environmental interactions or different exposures, we, we, we don't know. But you are absolutely right that there is tremendous variation at the individual level uh, that can determine uh, diabetes and prediabetes risk in the right, or I should say, in the wrong setting, particularly. Other comments or discussion about this topic? Uh, this is Dan, if I could jump in just quickly. Um, so thank you, Dean, for a, a, a wonderful summary of, um, of the socio-ecological model. And I'm not so much to add, but to underscore a few things you said. Um, so clearly, this has to, it's about behaviors, but it's about more than behaviors. So even on the behavioral side, stress um, and trauma have their, um, their impact. Um, we know that high-fat, high-calorie foods actually reduce HPA axis, stress hormones, and, and other um, mechanisms by which people who are who are stressed um, would actually reach for foods that are, are are less helpful than others, and that's assuming that they have equal access to helpful foods, which of course many do not, as you pointed out. Um, the issue of food insecurity is huge, and um, it's not just the quantity of foods available to someone, but the quality of foods that are consistently and reliably available. Um, food insecurity not only um, increases risk for diabetes through the um, often um, low quality carbohydrates that folks have to consume, but, but also directly through um, the stress of it, including um, inflammatory and other um, metabolic kind of responses. So, um, so even the behaviors themselves um, have, have um, relation to the social environment hugely. Um, and again, to underscore that it's not just behaviors, um, but it's the biological in, um, embedding of, of life experience factors, uh, not just in adulthood with adult stresses and traumas, but as you mentioned, um, in early life and even in utero, we know that people with um, high adverse childhood experiences scores are more likely to have cardiovascular um, disease and other metabolic risk factors. We know that um, stress, trauma, and, and food inadequacy during pregnancy also becomes um, biologically embedded through a number of mechanisms, both um, epigenetic but also um, direct, directly in terms of um, development of cells and organs and, and um, many other and muscle mass. So it's a, it's a complex picture, um, but 
we absolutely are highly um, um, sensitive to our environment, in fact, we're biologically designed to be so that our bodies can adapt to whatever situation uh, we find ourselves in, whether that's uh, one of plenty and, and adequate um, nurturing and nutrition or the opposite. Um, and we can adapt to whatever, but there are consequences metabolically, behaviorally, for having to adapt to difficult life circumstances um, across the lifespan, but especially in early life. So just wanted to underscore a few of the things you said. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. This is Naomi. I'd like to underscore another part, and that comes from the food and nutrition perspective, and that I still think that it's not um, clearly definitive, nor is there clear consensus of what constitutes, quote, quality food. So we have to be very careful when we try to attribute some of the um, potential causal relationships to diet to the fact that we do know how food interacts and influence and the metabolic profile of an individual. So, Naomi, would you say more dietary composition then or admixture or how would you define it? Well, it probably is the whole issue of the um, pattern, the dietary pattern. But I think one of the challenges we face globally as well as nationally is the fact that there is a lot of confusion about food and there's a creation of an atmosphere of um, punitive recommendations if one doesn't, quote, adhere to a particular guideline. And I think we do have to be open about the fact that um, we must individualize to a certain extent as much as we can and make the most of what is available and that people have access to rather than having a whole host of people who are haves and have not. So that, that sort of may be more of a sociological approach, but I just wanted to emphasize that, that it's not that cut and dry as to what, you know, a particular diet will or will not do for a particular individual. Naomi, Naomi, would you, I appreciate your, your comments as a dean, and it does reflect the relative paucity of experimental research in, in nutrition that, that has gone on over the last 50 years compared to other forms of discovery science. Right. Um, uh, wow, it just said that excrement research. I did not say excrement research, but anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> the microbiome, it's all about the microbiome. Um, uh, but Dean? Would, would you say Dean? that, yes. Hi, this is Linda Harris. I uh, just uh, want to remind everyone to please identify yourself when you speak. Thanks. Yes, and so Dean Schillinger. So um, I, I did want to ask, so would you say that the inverse is also true, that we know relatively little about those foods that represent poor dietary quality or poor nutritional value or those foods that promote metabolic diseases? Well, you know, I, I do think that there are aspects of certain foods and food groups that may increase one's risk. But then it also is the interaction with then the individual and his or her, you know, genetic metabolic phenotype. So I, I think, you know, I tend to think that the challenge we face today is that there's great polarization of the food supply as one being good and the other one being bad or whatever. And in the process of doing that, we're losing sight of the fact that people need adequate access or access to adequate food and that many of the um, potentially negative interactions that may occur can um, be modified by sort of an appropriate mixture of different types of food. But, yeah, right. That is that is a hypothesis, right? Yeah. Um, and I would say what's what's different, perhaps, about this, these the social ecological model and the, the chronic care model that we will discuss is that these are um, these are not necessarily causally linked for every person. These are population level exposures exactly. that increase your risk of, of risk in this case. So 
uh, being exposed to, let's say, uh, sugary sweetened beverages, uh, particularly in high quantities, increases the likelihood that a population will develop diabetes. It does not mean that an individual or a subpopulation necessarily will, but um, the socio-ecological model is looking at the entire population or community as a whole. And so I think navigating the tension between uh, a science that uh, looks at the individual as a unit of analysis versus a science that looks at the population as a unit of analysis is partly the tension that we're discussing. Correct. And I, I think you put it well in that um, I do think that the issue is the fact that associations with large populations and various factors does not imply causality, that there's a tendency for individuals to want to believe that they're causally related. Well, I wasn't necessarily saying, sorry, Dean Schellinger again. Yes. Um, I think there is a body of, uh, uh, of literature around specific food and beverage groups that includes uh, experimental uh, research that does strongly suggest causation. It does not, what I was saying is it does not mean that these are causal in every individual and that right. there are certain individuals who may be more vulnerable to the exposure and others who are not vulnerable at all. Exactly. Um, but and then, and then you're also right to say that there's a whole bunch of epidemiologic literature that is associative and not designed to infer causation for which the general public and some scientists and, and clinicians are, are, you know, are eager to jump on. And um, it's an important piece of information, but it's not definitive. Correct. Yes, I think we're saying the same thing. Thank you. Yes, this is Bill again. Dean, do you want to move on to the sure. model now? Yeah. So um, the expanded chronic care model is a, a, a relatively new um, adaptation of the original chronic care model that was developed by Ed Wagner and colleagues at Group Health in Seattle, uh, which was a um, closed managed care health plan um, that was a prepaid uh, capitated system that enabled uh, the health system to see the patient in a different way than the fee-for-service model. In other words, see the patient's health as being generated by uh, uh, both system level, uh, clinician level, patient level, and community level factors. Um, and that unless we address all those factors as a health system, we would um, be generating um, uh, ill health and uh, excessive costs related to that, and so that we as a health system need to be thinking differently about how we deliver care beyond just the office encounter. And this uh, chronic care model has been uh, validated in numerous settings beyond uh, managed care uh, or prepaid uh, health plans and uh, has been uh, widely accepted. Um, I will say it is somewhat Dated in terms of the uh, specifically the health IT components that are increasingly available in uh, contemporary healthcare, but I think it would not be that difficult to add in issues related to uh, devices and technology that are um, part of the commission's charge. So, um, if we again start at the bottom, um, the uh, goals of the expanded chronic care model are primarily the functional and clinical outcomes of the patients in the health plan, in this case, or are cared for by the health system. The expanded chronic care model, however, includes population health outcomes, partly because this is developed for, for the notion of a health plan that has, is an accountable care organization, accountable to the entire population of health enrollees. But the important distinction here is the population being defined is the population of, of insured enrollees in the plan, not necessarily the population that represents the non-enrollees in the community or in the neighboring city or state. Nonetheless, there um, are very helpful um, uh, pieces of this that also intersect with the socio-ecological model. Sticking at the, uh, to the bottom a horizontal um, row, you see that the in the center, the uh, most important part of the chronic care model is that both the clinician 
team on the right and the uh, patient and uh, caregivers on the left engage in productive interactions and relationships. That this is kind of where the rubber meets the road, particularly for people with uh, diabetes. And that unless these interactions are productive and unless the relationships are mutually respectful and um, uh, uh, re uh, reflect a, a trust, that uh, suboptimal functional and clinical health outcomes will result. In addition, uh, the adaptation recently added to the chronic care model is that the informed activated patient is supported by an activated community. So uh, the person with type 2 diabetes uh, for whom, let's say, food insecurity is identified as a problem or for whom a uh, person with prediabetes to whom we want to refer to um, a diabetes prevention program has a community around her that is activated, ready, willing, and resourced to be able to support her in the task she needs to accomplish for self-management. Similarly, the proactive practice team is empowered and uh, resourced by community partners to whom uh, they can refer and rely on to support them as they are supporting the patient in her uh, disease prevention or control efforts. Uh, this certainly um, resonates with me as a primary care doctor. This is what we need to be doing in our office encounters and increasingly in our digital encounters that we are having with patients, whether it's through telemedicine or through the increasingly prevalent patient portal uh, system. Um, we recently learned that at Kaiser, for example, 50% of their interactions with patients with diabetes are now happening over the patient portal. So these relationships and interactions are happening both in real time in person, um, store and forward, um, and digitally. Um, all of this um, uh, requires, yes. This, this is Phil. Can you just uh, uh, flesh out the community partners, who they might be, and how they would interact? Um, on the right side here? Yes, for the uh, prepared proactive practice team. Sure. So I think for I will stick to type 2 diabetes, partly because that's what I'm most familiar with and that's what we're, we're talking about here, but it's also some of them are relevant for type 1. I would think that the community partners of greatest relevance here would be those involved in the food safety net, those involved in um, uh, enabling uh, physical activity, uh, both space and resources, to uh, enable patients to, to be physically active, whether it's in a walking group or a YMCA or what have you. I would imagine they would include um, community partners related to mental health. Uh, sometimes they are part of a health system, but often they are carved out. Um, uh, others include uh, adult uh, learning environments for people with lower literacy levels who really can't manage the disease because they don't understand what they're being expected to do. Um, I'm sure others would have uh, ideas that, for me, it's, you know, where can I get transportation vouchers for my patients? Where can I get a reliable, durable medical equipment supplier to give them um, diabetic shoes or the ancillary equipment they need to be ambulatory? Um, those sorts of things. Great, thanks. Uh, another one that kind of comes to mind is support systems for the blind. Um, uh, that's a very important thing for people with diabetes. Um, so all of these um, interactions and relationships really can only happen if the clinicians and the partners and the patients and the community are functioning within the context of a health system that supports them in, uh, in, in, their, in their role. Um, and the attributes of health systems that um, reflect uh, the chronic care model best are those um, that have information systems that allow for um, uh, both real-time and a store and forward communication with the patient and caregivers and between the um, healthcare providers themselves uh, so that if my patient sees, uh, has a major depression and diabetes, that the record of the visit, whether they even attended a visit with a mental health professional 
and what the content of that visit and outcome of that so those visits are, assuming the patient has providing consent, would be visible to me and not in some black box that I, as a clinician, would be unaware of. And similarly, that the patient could, if she wanted, have access to her medical records through an open chart system and be able to uh, communicate with uh, her care provider. Uh, similarly, um, increasing IT support uh, could provide support for patients and clinicians around decisions related to the prevention and management of diabetes and its complications. Uh, this is increasingly important and increasingly sophisticated with um, artificial intelligence and um, uh, has become more robust on the clinician side, but clearly a lot more work needs to be done to enable patients to um, make informed decisions in their own homes with their own families uh, present. Um, delivery system design specifically, I believe, relates to transitioning from a system that relies on individual clinicians to carry the burden uh, to uh, more team-based care models, which require significant redesign, both in terms of space and functionality, but also in terms of workflows and um, uh, computer systems to enable teams to function together. Uh, an initial attribute of health systems are that, they, that, that are aligned with the chronic care model are those that uh, understand and resource appropriately the fact that patients with diabetes spend 99.9% .9 of their time at home and in the community, and that as such, they need significant self-management support, not only when they are diagnosed with the, with the illness, but throughout the course of their illness, um, and throughout the complications that they may uh, acquire. And that kind of support is not typically something that can be done consistently in a 15 to 20 minute visit, but needs to be uh, carried out, uh, whether it's by peers or special health education professionals in uh, in person or online, um, but that this needs to be a priority, not an afterthought for health systems interested in promoting uh, chronic care health. Um, and then as we move outside of the health system, the expanded chronic care model um, uh, acknowledges that attributes of the community, attributes of public policy, um, the need for supportive environments, and the need for um, civic engagement on the part of the community are all needed in order to generate the activated community and the proactive community partners that are needed for the patients under the care of this uh, health system. So in that regard, there is significant overlap with the socio-ecological model, albeit a little bit um, less specific and a little bit more oriented to the enrolled population. But nonetheless, I think there are important um, uh, domains in this outer uh, circle or ellipse that have overlap with the socio-ecological model. So um, again, I'll open it up to comments or questions and, and, and particularly comments as to whether or not the work of the subcommittees align with these models and, and what may be missing from them. I'll stop. Great. Thanks, Dean. Any comments or questions and particularly from the subcommittees, do you think that the focus areas you've identified can fit into some combination of these two models? Hi, this is uh, Sherry Bolin. Um, yeah, I, I like, I'm familiar with both of these and, and like the, uh, the choice of them for the work that we're doing um, and have uh, enjoyed hearing some of the different perspectives of, as we have discussed them. I think this is on the, the social ecological model, um, but it just strikes me that I think the chronic care model doesn't really have a, maybe it's under public policy or community, but doesn't really have a great place for payer engagement. Um, and so I think that's important in the chronic care model too, um, to think about uh, how the, the payers can um, impact and contribute. So I, I just, um, throw that out there and, and maybe it's there in one of these other terms and just not as clear, but just something to consider. No, I, I think this is Dean Schillinger. I think you're absolutely right. And in part, it's because it was developed by, kind of by payers, right? So they're implicit in there. 
um, but you're right that it's not called out. And I would say it's payers, it's, it's financing model, right? How pharmaceuticals and devices are covered or not covered and who pays. I mean, all, all of that is, needs to be, to be in there. And this, this is Ann Albright. I think the uh, payers actually should be on both or whatever if we've agreed any combination of what we use. But clearly, even the socioecologic model is clearly one of the sectors of influence because anytime you're trying to deliver something in a community outside of the healthcare setting, you still need to be able to pay for it. Too often, the expectation is that anybody working out in the community is always going to volunteer. And I think if we're really going to do what we need to do, which is link the community and clinical sector to be successful, then there has to be payment that extends out into the community for sure. Absolutely. Good. Other comments? Are there, are there pieces that folks think might be missing from these models or things that don't fit into the model? Good. Well, thank Bill, you very much. Bill, yeah. can I just make one last uh, set of comments? Yes. Yeah. Dean Schoenger. So what... Um, uh, and uh, myself and Linda have been discussing in, as an idea would be to think about these two models as both operating independently but also synergistically. Um, the expanded chronic care models um, outcomes relate to an enrolled population. The socioecological model relates to the general population, but there is clearly overlap. And so the idea would be that we would somehow create a, uh, a synthesized um, model that would allow these factors that have been um, uh, developed to operate both within the clinic for those who are enrolled and seeing clinicians and outside of the clinic for the population that is not either enrolled or seeking care, and that these are both sometimes mutually exclusive, and as Anne pointed out, often um, can mutually benefit from each other. But to pick one over the other, to me, would seem to be a mistake. And so we're, we, we're, our aspiration is to try to synthesize the two into something that would work for all the subcommittees. You would certainly agree with that, and I think one of the goals would be to move people without access or who are not utilizing care into take care of system. Definitely. This, this is Sherry Bowen. Um, yeah, I mean, often when we, when I have written things, um, I've actually included both models, so I, I don't think it, it has to fit into one, although that sounds great if you can do that, but I think it's also uh, completely fine to describe them both and have them both, so I, I just throwing that out there. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Good. Well, let's move on to the uh, subcommittee reports. And actually, it looks like Ann and Dean are up again with uh, subcommittee one, uh, the prevention in the general population and discussing their focus areas and how they might fit into these two models. Ann, do you want to, uh, do you want to drive this one? Well, it's not much to drive, Dean, as you know. This is Ann. Uh, Ann Bullock, sorry, the two Ann's on the call. Uh, so, so pretty much, uh, Dean and I just became the, the co-chairs of this subcommittee, so we're, we're um, just picking it up. Um, but mostly, you, uh, Dean's excellent descriptions um, really do um, describe what, what it is that uh, we think our subcommittee can, can, um, can highlight a particular in relation to all this. Um, so as you're seeing there, this is a, a nice distillation of, of what um, Dean and, and all of us have been talking about on the call. So um, this, this, the type 2 diabetes, as we're saying here, epidemic our technologic trajectory, and um, it, it comes from so many things, and it, it, it results in so many things. So the rapidly changing uh, food and beverage environment, we had a discussion about that, um, physical activity, but, but also particularly this embodied stress response um, to socioeconomic conditions. And, and as, as we're thinking about um, the, the conversation we were just, just having about the two models together, um, in Indian Health Service, which actually, um, Ed Wacker acknowledges, um, IHS was one of the, the bases for his original concept of the chronic care model. Um, and ours is a, is a basically a single payer health system, but we therefore don't have to look at just those who are, um, um, have a particular health plan or, or insurance or, or employed. And we're able to, um, to look at the whole community, I'll say as a patient, that sounds like I'm trying to make the community sound sound sick, which they are not, but, but to see the whole community as our um, our collective um, partner and responsibility. 
um, and, and as part of that, to extend um, um, the clinic beyond the four, literal four walls, as Ann Albright said, you can not always great payments for, for doing those sorts of things, but using um, community health workers and public health nurses. Um, this is one of the ways that we can actually kind of, one of the many ways to bridge those two models together is to um, both work at the societal and policy level to make changes um, that have broad and um, deep impact. Um, for example, an, an increase in the earned income tax credit and, and an improvement in SNAP benefits would probably do more um, to help prevent and manage diabetes than, than many other things that, that could be um, um, thought of for individual patients. Um, but nonetheless, there is that, 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 that very important link between the individual experience, their ability to access care, um, and, and viewing the community itself as a partner not just the people who darken the doors of, of clinics. So, um, so looking at how to um, bring all of that together is what we think um, our subcommittee is um, obviously especially passionate about, and and um, and that includes not just HHS, but as we say, you know, as you can see here on the slide, um, USDA, FDA, Education, Labor, EPA. There are dozens of metabolically active um, environmental toxins that um, increase the uh, risk for obesity and diabetes over time, especially when the exposures um, happen um, in utero or otherwise in early life. So um, looking at all of these things as, as, as critical factors, even if those agencies, departments, and, and, and others don't see themselves as being um, related to diabetes, they absolutely are. Um, so we know that um, agriculture policy is diabetes policy for example, and like I just mentioned, and environmental toxin policy is diabetes policy. So being able to um, to bring all of that together is, is just critically important um, because we can be penny wise and pound foolish here. Um, we can, you know, advocate for some particular um, improvement in, in this or that care, and that's critically important. Don't, don't mishear me. But if we're going to look at um, uh, the most good for the most people, um, it's really backing up and looking at the larger picture through, um, through these policy kinds of changes. So, um, and, and of course, we have some populations that are, are particularly at risk. And so, again, um, in making improvements in those populations, those of poverty, um, those who are in inner cities, those who are very rural or on reservations, um, those kinds of things um, are critically important to, um, to improving overall health, but also um, we'll see more improvements in those communities um, that we might in, in more generally targeted things. So looking at them both ways, what, where are we going to do the most good for the most people? Um, obviously, we want to promote more physical activity opportunities um, in, in, in so many ways, and you can see some examples um, listed there. But again, we know that stress and trauma relate to this. There's even some evidence that hormonal changes actually um, reduce, can predict uh, reduction in physical activity um, because if if life is hard and things are tough, then that makes sense that the body would say you've got to slow down and conserve. So, um, again, all of this comes back around and relates to the very complex um, human systems that we are individually as, and collectively. Um, and then the second major point here is the well-being of pregnant mothers, children, uh, youth, and disadvantaged. So I mentioned about disadvantaged populations, but this in utero and early life, um, in, in embedding of, of, of risk, of, of adversity, um, is becoming more and more clear, and again, it's multiple mechanisms. There's some evidence for epigenetics for sure, but, but there are, that is not the only mechanism, and we shouldn't um, hang our hats on just one or another as, as the um, science develops around these things. We know for sure that those are critical um, and sensitive points in development, um, and uh, we know enough about the mechanisms that are causing that. You know, the, these are times we absolutely have to focus on if we hope to reduce the intergenerational transmission of risk for many things, including the risk for obesity and diabetes. And there are some interventions now that are showing some um, uh, reduction in those kinds of risks. Um, and again, promoting this more population level research, we, um, we're, we're good at looking at how things affect what we think you know, more of the individual or family level. Um, and that's what our healthcare systems are trying to figure out. How do we connect people to, to, um, to resources that, uh, for individuals and families? And that, again, is critically important. But within that context is um, what policies, um, if the government and other um, kind of overarching um, systems, what are they doing that make um, the need for that more or less necessary? 
So what can we do and how can we research this? How can we find um, examples of changes? Um, I think we've discussed a little bit by email at least how there's increasingly now some examples in asthma where uh, reductions in, um, in air pollution um, have um, made a difference in, in asthma outcomes uh, for, for both children developing it as well as um, exacerbations in those who have asthma. So there's so much that can be done here. In some ways, it's, it's trying to you know put your arms around almost everything in some ways. But, but, but this is the kind of thing we have to, to look at because as a commission, we have this unique ability to um, pr provide a report to, to Congress, to the government, that says um, to the government as a very unique institution um, with, with control over policies, funding, and so many kinds of things, um, what would be the things that would make the most difference in helping us prevent and treat diabetes. Um, so <laughs> with that lofty goal, I want to say that these are the kinds of things that our subcommittee will be talking about moving forward. Dean, do you have other things to add to that? No, I just, thanks, Sam. Um, I just want to, uh, obviously we'll open it up for comment and questions, but I think if I can move the slide back one, I can't, so somebody else can move the slide back one. Right. Um, the, the third bullet, little bullet point, the collaboration between federal agencies and the health and non-health domains presents an unprecedented opportunity. Um, I think given the fact that this very issue is being discussed um, by Don and, uh, and whoever he, he is um, reporting to, I think it would be important at some point on this call for, for us to, to know if there is a consensus or differences of opinion as to whether or not we believe as the Commission that the scope of work of the Commission includes uh, understanding uh, how non-health agencies um, could do work differently to positively impact the diabetes epidemic, how they could work together, uh, et cetera. Because I think that um, it's important that we are able to speak as, as one voice. Steve, it doesn't necessarily have to be everybody, but if there is unanimity or if there is a majority feeling, but I just wanted to put that out there, that if there are differences of opinion on this, if this now would be a good time to hear it, or if there is consensus around it, now would also be a good time to hear it. Because as a subcommittee, we're sort of on the bubble here. Dean, this is, is Bill. I think the charter pretty clearly indicates that our our objective is to evaluate and make recommendations uh, about programs both within the department and other federal agencies. So I, I think the scope of our work clearly would encompass DHHS and other relevant agencies. I think the issue at this point is perhaps more whether we can be using the data call for information from the other agencies. But I think to the extent that we as a group have bought into the socio-ecological model, uh, I, I think the commission recognizes that uh, these other factors are important. I guess it would be uh, interesting to hear if there is any dissent from that or whether that is the consensus of the members of the commission at this point. So does anyone disagree that we as the commission should be looking at, at these more uh, broad uh, social determinants of health or, or social influences on medical care? This is Ann Albright again. I am the first to not disagree with that. I think it's absolutely critical to achieve what we're trying to achieve. I think that there we need to consider the sort of continuum of risk and the continuum of uh, available interventions and the level of evidence. And I think we also have to consider the fact that when one is trying to implement an intervention and allow it to be done nationwide, we have not been very successful at that. We actually have some good evidence for, for things that can certainly help um, in addition to the really huge mountain to climb in the social determinants of health. But I think we unfortunately often settle for never getting them scaled to the extent they need to be scaled. But I also think we need to choose wisely. 
so we shouldn't have a lot of noise going on where there there's just everybody's trying to run all over and implement this little program here and that program there and this one here. It just ends up creating a lot of chaos, and I think it ends up ultimately detracting from our ability to deal with these, as, as Dean and, and Anne beautifully described, these key drivers um, to health for everyone, including those with and at risk for diabetes. I think the challenge for, for all of us as a nation is how do we address these things? How, how do we address poverty and on these stresses that come through abuse and a number of other things that have gone on? These are huge, much of which may be driven by policy, certainly can be driven by policy, some of which is under the influence of the federal government directly. And then as some of it is under the power of those voters who uh, bring those elected officials into office. And so I think just as we're going forward with our commission recommendations, I think we have to figure out how to offer recommendations that may be directed at the agencies within the federal government that may be under the influence of policies that, that they that fall within their purview. A lot of what our policies fall under is congressional direction or, or legal authority and, and regulations. And so I think as we further our work with the data call and the conversations we're having, um, the commission, we are going to have to determine if we want to make recommendations that, that quite frankly, people outside of the government are going to have to drive um, and or uh, recommendations that really would solely fall under the purview of the OEC's existing uh, mission and requirements and, and regulations and authority of the existing um, agencies within the federal government. I just add that into our conversation because I, I'm sure we are all incredibly committed to achieving a healthy nation and to be able to do that through addressing social determinants. You, you, I, my view is that uh, addressing what has been described under the sociologic model, the expanded current care model, and then interventions that are uh, directed at, at individuals who need to engage in a lifestyle intervention be supported, not blamed, not um, told that it's all under your control, but supported so that they indeed can and live in a healthy environment and still have to make some, some choices or selections um, ultimately. Um, that we want to be sure that we are clear that those are really inextricably linked. We need both. And, and I wish with all my heart that we would stop hitting them against each other. And I think as a commission, we have a real opportunity to frame this, hopefully, using this combination of models so that it, it's not, oh, we're only for trying to do all policies alone. We're only trying for um, interventions or programs for people. We'll never succeed with either one alone. And hopefully, um, using these two models will help us put them together and we'll also be able to, to have conversations about what I was speaking earlier and make recommendations that allow us to get to these root causes, these social determinants, but we can do it in a way that will um, uh, be clear to um, whose authority and what requirements they fall under and which things will need to be exercised by those outside of the federal government. Yeah, and this, this is Dean Schellinger. I, I really appreciate what, what you just said, and I really, in particular, uh, like how you, you know, A, we need to be strategic, is what I heard you say, right? And we need to be, you know, very kind of razor sharp and uh, not overly comprehensive because you can dilute the effect. And B, the fact that we need to be clear in our recommendations which ones of these could be done in a relatively short turnaround, because the agency has the authority or the uh, et cetera uh, to to make such decisions, versus those that would require uh, di different levels of authority or different laws or different policies that that would take more time and more, quite frankly, more politics, right? Which means yep. the outside. And I, and I think that speaking for myself, um deep knowledge of those regulatory um, constraints um, are certainly beyond beyond my reach. And I think part of our quote-unquote research is going to be to understand those inner workings of the agencies enough to be able to be clear. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And hopefully in the, the data calls, and I think we tried to get at that in some of the questions, it, it would be under sort of what, what, which authorities do you operate. And I think that can, that, and certainly in the conversation we're having now, particularly as we're trying to address things that relate to social determinants or these larger uh, policy um, efforts, that would be helpful. I think many of us even working in the federal government, it can be challenging because interpretation of those regulations can sometimes seem to vary <laughs> depending on um, the date. But um, I think it would be helpful. It's probably an area to probe uh, as we get information back in the data call for sure. This is uh, this is Jill. I'm aware of the time, and we're running a little behind. Um, uh, Linda, should we go ahead with the subcommittee two report, the prevention targeted population, or should we break now and come back in uh, ten minutes to continue that discussion? Um, I think the most important thing is that we are um, or finished by the time the uh, public comment period starts. So we could either proceed and skip the break or uh, skip the break and, and make it fast. Um, why don't we take a break now for uh, for 10 minutes or 5 minutes if people can just uh, put their uh, phones on mute. And let, let's plan to reconvene for the commission members at uh, 3.25. So uh, seven minutes, if we could. And okay. we'll pick up. We'll pick up then with subcommittee uh, two and three. And I do want Barbara Linder to say something about uh, cross-cutting research initiatives as well. Okay. okay. So back in seven minutes. Good, Linda. Are we ready to reconvene? Uh, we're ready. We're here. Okay, did you want to do a quick roll roll call? Sure. Uh, Anne? Anne Bush. All right. Yes, I'm here. Howard. Hi, here. Barry. Yep, I'm here. Naomi. Naomi. Donald Shell. Here. William Chong. I'm here. Aaron. Aaron. Ann Bala. Here. Barbara. Yes. David. Here. Paul. Lynn. Oh, Lynn. Here. Okay. Are you Sunday? Here. Carol. Here. Uh, David. Here. Dean. Here. Helen. Here. Jasmine. Here. John. Here. Here uh, Shannon. Here. Sherry. Here. Bill Cook. Bill. Uh, Naomi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And Aaron. So we have Aaron and Bill. Did Helen Lucy this morning? Yeah, I, I, I think they'll join sure, in. I Good. I, th I think we should go ahead and uh, get started yep. again. Okay. Good. So I wanted to turn it over to Subcommittee to Prevention Targeted Population, Ann Albright and John Baltry. Thank you, Bill. This is John Baltry. I'll, I'll get started. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So the Prevention Targeted Population Subcommittee of the NCCC is focused on people who are at high risk for developing diabetes but don't yet have diabetes. So the focus of the Prevention Targeted Population Subcommittee is on the following four areas. 
screening high-risk people for prediabetes, including impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose. Some of the people in this targeted high-risk group will also be identified as having new onset diabetes. In other words, uh, when we're screening for prediabetes, we'll find some people who also have diabetes but didn't know they had diabetes. Um, the second area is preventing or delaying the transition from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes and delaying or preventing the adverse health outcomes associated with type 2 diabetes through early intervention. Uh, the third area will be sustaining the effectiveness of type 2 diabetes prevention programs. What happens to people after they have completed a diabetes prevention program, for example? Is there adequate post-maintenance programming that's being offered? And if not, can we enhance that? And then the final area will be developing new and more effective preventative strategies for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Can I have the next slide, please? So the emphasis of the targeted population subcommittee will be on these four areas. First, we'll be seeking to determine how to improve on identification of people with prediabetes and diabetes. How can we achieve universal screening of everybody who is at high risk for developing diabetes? Next, how can we improve the availability and uptake of proven effective interventions such as the diabetes prevention program for preventing or delaying the onset of type 2 diabetes? We know there are effective prevent preventative inter interventions such as structured lifestyle change programs as well as certain medications that markedly reduce the progression of prediabetes that are both cost-effective and cost-saving. However, there are many people with prediabetes who have not participated in diabetes prevention programs, and there are many more who start programs and only partially complete them. The programs that are available are not being utilized at a rate that could be highly beneficial to the American public. Third, it appears that most people who complete a diabetes prevention program have little follow-up after they complete the program. How can we better maintain and build on the gains that people obtain from participating in a lifestyle change program? For example, the maintenance, the maintenance programs and ongoing support groups need to be created nationwide. Finally, how can we develop more effective individual and population strategies to prevent both type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Are the current lifestyle change programs that are in place, such as the diabetes prevention program, the most effective interventions for preventing type 2 diabetes? Or are there other interventions that might, might be even more effective and scalable? And regarding type 1 diabetes, more research is needed to help prevent uh, the development or slow the progression of type 1 diabetes. Now, there's still a lot that we need to learn to understand how to best prevent um, these debilitating illnesses. So that's a, a quick summary of the emphasis and focus of the Prevention Targeted Population Subcommittee. I'd like to ask Ann Albright if she would like to add some supplementary comments and clarity to the Prevention Targeted Population Committee approach. Uh, no, John, I don't really think I have anything to add. I think probably, hopefully, a number of the comments I, I made it with earlier to our presentation um, that supplement our presentation. Again, I just really want to underscore that the general population and, and targeted must be linked together. They're, they really are inextricably tied together. So I think we're trying to maximize the implementation and scalability of interventions that have been shown to be very successful with those that are at high risk and that uh, those really need to be maximized much more effectively than we have and the critical nature of research in order to in advance what we can do to prevent uh, type 2 diabetes and hopefully one day type 1 uh, and that it can be done on a large scale. So I think sometimes, they, as I said, I think people have not embraced or are willing to take what it's do is going to take to actually scale uh, effective interventions. And also an area of research that's clearly needed is on how to help people stay engaged. Um, and, and that's true for whatever um, intervention or whatever effort is needed. Unless we come up with 100% passive things, it still does uh, require that we have some level of engagement. And that's even true for a number of the policies that are being suggested for implementation. They still do involve some um, action on, on someone's part. 
And so I think it's um, it's why they, they both need to be linked together and there are things that can be shared and learned uh, between both. Good. Thank you, Ann and John. And do you think the models that have been proposed would accommodate the prevention targeted population work? This is John Voltry. Yes, I think that uh, both the First model, the socio-ecologic model makes a lot of sense for the larger framework and larger population. Um, the chronic care model makes uh, sense for folks that already know they have a diagnosis and uh, uh, that can really help us to sort of move forward in our understanding of, of how to make the best advice to uh, Congress and HHS. Yeah, this is Ann Albright. I, I agree that uh, the work of the targeted population certainly does fit into both. And I think it, this is where we have a real opportunity. I think it's seen as you were describing, and Sherry, you said you've written with, with both models. They're in the expanded chronic care model phase, they did begin to underscore that link to the community. And I think that's what had been missing in the original chronic care model. It was, it was a very small component of it. Um, and so I think the fact that if that ecologic model can really be reaching and the, the chronic care model can be reaching, we can have a stronger bridge between those two in which we really are linking things that go on outside a, a clinical sector, some of which may be viewed as more quote-unquote clinical. But I think, again, it's how we frame these things, that if they can be delivered by um, health workers and trained lay people and not have to be reliant solely on healthcare professionals, they, they truly do reach outside of the healthcare system. But again, for payment, there's got to be some linkage to how we pay for services uh, in our in our country. So if one day that's not paid for out of the healthcare system, then maybe that piece of the link wouldn't need to be as strong. But currently, that's how anyone is going to get paid for services that impact health. So I think that that's where we need a much stronger bridge or link between between the models is where we're talking about what reaches and goes on out where people live and work and spend most of their time. And Sherry's point about payer engagement and benefit structure. Yeah. Any other comments or questions, discussion on this from anyone from the commission? I have a question of Dean Schillinger. Um, thanks for this. Uh, presentation, um, and, and I know, like all of ours, it's at a 10,000 foot level, but there were a couple of specifics that you mentioned that I wanted to get granular on if, if it's appropriate. The first was um, the strategies for screening. Were, did you um, specifically exclude hemoglobin A1C because of the overly sensitive nature? By that, I mean the overdiagnosis that it can it can lead to uh, for prediabetes, or, or, or is hemoglobin A1C on the table as a mechanism to screen? That's the first question. And in terms of um, uptake of proven effective interventions for the prevention of type 2 diabetes, um, does that include uh, metformin, uh, a medication, um, or is it specific to um, the uh, the the health behavior change um, work related to the to the national DPP. Yeah, thank you for asking that. This is John Boltry. I'm sorry, Anne. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for asking that. This is John Boltry. Um, no, we didn't in exclude A1C, and I'm glad you asked to clarify that. Nor did we want to exclude medication uh, as a form of prevention either. Thanks. Other comments? Good. Let's move on then to the report from the Treatment and Complications Subcommittee. And Carol, I think you'll be giving that. I will. And I, again, I apologize and I hope I don't cough. Um, so I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. And I'm going to start at the bottom with the health disparities in optimized individualized care. And access to health care actually means receiving, getting um, the care that's needed in a timely manner. And so factors that can um, change what is needed, I think we need to define what is needed, and that's where health disparities come in. What is needed 
can be impacted by a number of factors, and those, some of those factors can also serve as barriers for optimal individualized care. And they can range from uh, racial ethnic differences to cultural differences to where you live, location, um, to age, um, comorbidities, and complications. And so, uh, we also have biologic factors that can determine how someone responds to medication. So, we're moving away from one size fits all into that more population health uh, spectrum of needs. And we need to know more about what different groups need, both biologically, culturally, uh, socially, for instance, access to healthy food. But as uh, Naomi's mentioned and other people have mentioned, it's not one size fits all with food either. Some drugs may work better in different types of uh, diabetes. And here I'm talking about different types of type 2 diabetes or you can see pancreatic, uh, pancreatogenic diabetes, et cetera. So the recognition of uh, what type of diabetes is also part of this. Um, so getting more information around what is needed to deliver that individualized care, both the care that's needed and the barriers that are keeping people from getting that care. And then moving to the next one, care delivery and supporting payment models, new ways for the care team and the system to be sure the patients get what they need, it, need. and this um, does include uh, population health tools and methods, uh, team-based care, virtual care, uh, improved uh, clinical decision support, um, <laughs> including, and I hope as Barbara mentions this, uh, ways to reduce inertia. Uh, it includes interaction with communities and uh, community uh, resources, I should say, including schools. And then that intersects again with health disparities. For instance, uh, young people with type 1 diabetes living in remote areas, the school systems are intimidated by the new technology and then may impact them being able to utilize care that could benefit them. And most of the time, care delivery is described as the final mile. We have, you know, all the research, uh, basic research, clinical research, and then we need care delivery to get it to the patient. But with diabetes, the real final mile is their ability to take care of themselves and to live with diabetes in a healthy way and, and stay healthy. Um, and so diabetes self-management education and support becomes critical. And there's a lot of evidence to show the benefit of this, but there's also evidence to show that most people aren't getting it when they need it. Uh, there's a large delay when people get it. They don't get it at appropriate time. And this uh, has a big impact, uh, not just on the patient activation and their ability to, to have the knowledge and skills and confidence to take care of themselves, but it, it's also generating, uh, <clears throat> has a big role in generating diabetes distress. And depending on what population you look at, somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of our patients with diabetes have diabetes distress, which then interferes uh, with their well-being and their health outcomes. So um, looking at ways to be effective, including around literacy, social competency, numeracy, something that's often ignored. Um, and also, um, um, the barriers, what are their policies, are there payments, are, are, what are other things that are keeping our patients from getting the education that they need so that they can live healthier with this disease? And I will stop there. Lynn, did you want to add anything? No, um, we've discussed this before, and I think that Carol's right on target. Um, I will note that the VA is uh, trying to put in place a 
national numeracy campaign um, because uh, so many, um, especially in the realm of hypoglycemia, uh, so many errors can take place because patients may not understand calorie counting, um, how to do correction factors around insulin, uh, understand that the A1C test is in a range. That's something that uh, primary therapy, in fact, it comes from your work. Uh, so the hypoglycemia um, uh, racial differences may occur because of the uh, differential between um, A1C results and glycemia, but um, it's complex, and I think the basis to try and look at is just to try to understand um, basic everyday um, care. Uh, this is Cheryl again, and I just wanted to say shared decision-making intersects through all of these. Um, it's learning what we need to optimally individualize care or provide optimally individualized care, delivering it, and then the patients uh, delivering it for themselves. Shared decision making is woven in there, and I don't know if Barbara has talked about how we need to work on that. Maybe she can talk about that as well. And do you think that all of these elements fit reasonably well into the expanded chronic care model, or are there pieces of the model oh, I, to be adapted? Uh, I'm so sorry, I missed missing that. I think it really pulls nicely both models, the need for both models. And I really like uh, the idea of, um, uh, of the synergistic um, model. This is what if I can comment on the, the intersection between chronic care model quality and um, shared decision making. Uh, I, I think there needs to be a realignment um, because uh, performance measures as they're currently specified by national quality of committee for quality assurance and AQS. Uh, and in fact, the uh, national um, action plan for hypoglycemic safety specifically states um, that uh, at least for, you know, um, using the estimate percent, that it should be revised because it's not consistent with the evidence. Uh, individuals on uh, no medications um, or above 8 percent and healthy, I mean, clearly action is necessary, uh, uh, whereas patients who are on insulin um, with multiple chronic conditions um, clearly face an increased risk of uh, hypoglycemia. So, um, you know, um, and in the VA, uh, we never had a less than seven percent, and there was uh, less than eight percent for people over eight because of that reason. Uh, so, I did not see this in any of the presentations to date, uh, but I do think it might be worthwhile uh, going back to the National Action Plan uh, to revisit this um, and try to get some synergy amongst federal agencies and with the private sector on it. So alignment of performance measures, perhaps, as another area to focus on? Well, totally, it, it's not mentioned, I believe it should be, but totally, uh, the, it's very difficult to say that a patient who is um, struggling, um, has food insecurity, um, no social backup on insulin, uh, should be intensified when uh, with insulin, necessarily, what would their benefits and risks to be considered? And, and I think when you're looking at populations, um, is that is it, how can you possibly compare groups? Um, and that was one of the concerns when we started with group clip nearly a quarter century ago. How can you compare groups when you can't get information on social determinants of health or uh, comorbid conditions and, and try and make some comparisons? This originally was intended for in-house comparison, not a far place, and certainly not for payment. Um, so I do think it needs to be um, to revisited. And, and if I could go back 25 years and see the computer system still can't do it, um, I would have been amazed. In fact, I am amazed. Other other comments on this? Yeah, this is Dean Schillinger. I had a I had a question. Um, I, I did note in the final bullet point that, that you have the word um, access to, to treatment. I'm just wondering, um, so much of my experience uh, in taking care of patients with type 2 diabetes is that the diabetes has gone undiagnosed for quite a long time, and by the time I see them, they already have acquired the complications. I'm sure you've experienced this as well. And 
In large part, it's because not because we have missed the diagnosis, but because they have not had health insurance. And I'm just wondering if the, the, the access bullet point includes uh, anything about the fact that um, access to health care is, is problematic for, for many in the country, particularly those who are at risk of, of diabetes. Right. So we, we did emphasize that um, access to critical medications and services, including social care. Um, so access to health care in general, and so that's why we put access to family diagnosis and care appropriate to that we need to improve that. And, and when we talk about identifying and reducing barriers, and I put including knowledge gaps because there are there is biologic heterogeneity, but probably the biggest barriers that need to be tackled are what you just mentioned, Dean, is inability to afford care, uh, even if they have insurance, but especially yeah. if they don't have insurance. So thank you. And that's why we need that supporting um, payment model also. Um, because we can't provide the kind of care that's needed, um, like, you know, or expect the community to provide the care that's needed um, that will ultimately reduce costs, but we, they can't just do, like Anne said, volunteer. Any other quick comments on this? Hey, Carol, it's uh, Ellen Lee. Uh -huh. Thank you for your comment about uh, saying that, uh, you know, patients uh, are the last mile in self-management. Uh, and that is so true. And as we look at these two intersecting models, I want to make sure that we're looking at technology decision support. It is so important. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it lies in the hands of patients. I agree, and thank you. And it is on there. Uh, I would have probably needed to have six slides or more. So, but thank you. And and uh, we do have that highlighted, it, and I just re-highlighted it. So thank you, Ellen. Ellen. <laughs> this is open day, uh, Carol. Thank you for for putting it together. Uh, very comprehensive and sort of covers. I I, I would agree part of uh, what we think treatment and complications um, should cover. One of the things I would just wanted to add quickly, you may have mentioned this briefly, is the, that we not forget that as we think about this, um, especially when uh, diabetes self-management and uh, on uh, education support, and the idea of sometimes that there's a need to reduce uh, intensification rather than intensifying therapy, that it needs to be done in a manner that does not then create further this health disparity. Um, I think. The challenge sometimes is, is trying to understand whether the, the, the reason uh, why uh, someone's poorly controlled is because uh, that is what's in their best interest because of uh, comorbidities or because uh, providers have decided not to intensify care because it's convenient not to. It's a lot easier to have a five-minute conversation about um, moving away from intensification about it's a lot easier, it's a lot more work to intensify therapy sometimes, and in, in especially in, in some communities, uh, the amount of work that's involved in doing that is, is uh, on the, when you think about the effort from the care provider, um, is much more than it is to simply have a brief conversation and move on um, because yeah. of some resistance to intensification of, of therapy. So. I guess what I'm trying to get at is we we need to think about how to implement this in a manner that doesn't further increase health disparity. Thank you. That's a really good point. So it would be inappropriate justification of uh, of that level of glycemic control, you know, instead of putting the needed effort in. And that's a really good thing to keep in the in the picture. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ayesha and Dan. I think that that might be a good transition to Barbara Linder, who has some uh, cross-cutting research areas that, that she wanted to address. Um, okay, so um, you know, this came from you know Clydette's email 
to us to each send in, you know, suggestions for focus areas. So, um, you know, I use the opportunity to engage people here to think about, you know, from a research perspective, you know, what would be some broad areas that, you know, we think we need to really, you know, emphasize. And really, I think what we proposed has already been um, highlighted, you know, by the various committees. Um, but Bill asked me um, to go through this, so, you know, I will try to do it quickly. We highlighted three areas, um, health disparities, therapeutic inertia, and individualized medicine. And, and it, in terms of the health disparities, um, in particular, um, we noted the need to better understand social determinants of health and identify the barriers that people face. Um, to achieving good health outcomes, but then moving beyond that to really demonstrate how to effectively integrate, you know, identifying these barriers and doing something about them um, during the healthcare delivery um, encounter. Um, and, you know, research in this area certainly could include healthcare system and community linkages. Um, you know, as Dean talked about um, in his presentation. And then the second topic, which was therapeutic inertia, um, we felt that this had to be addressed at multiple levels, so the patient, the provider, the healthcare system, and certainly the policy level um, as well. Um, in terms of the provider, um, we think we need better research to understand um, how to help uh, providers understand clinical care guidelines and overcome barriers to them, um, you know, adopting those clinical care guidelines, including appropriate screening for chronic diseases and regimen intensification, but when appropriate. So this really speaks to some of the points that Len just made. Um, in, in terms of the patient or the caregiver, um, you know, research to um, better understand um, how to help facilitate uh, patients' understanding of treatment regimens in, in order to enhance adherence. And this really goes back to understanding, you know, barriers to care, particularly the social determinants of health, and how to enhance communication between providers um, and um, patients and the healthcare system and, and patients. Um, and it would also include um, things that Carol talked about, um, such as novel healthcare appointments and healthcare system strategies, uh, particularly shared um, decision making, um, which I think we need uh, much more research around how to implement um, and, and other patient centered approaches. And, you know, also the acknowledgement that um, these sorts of approaches. Um, need to look at the use of physician extenders and community um, healthcare workers um, where there's a, a lot of evidence um, for um, their use. And then finally, how to promote access and uptake to diabetes self-management education and support. So that was sort of all under the topic of therapeutic inertia. And then finally, individualized, you know, medicine. Um, thinking that, you know, prevention and management of a chronic disease like diabetes really needs individualized approaches if we're going to achieve um, long-term health, and that this is true from both a behavioral perspective as well as a biologic perspective, um, especially as it becomes, you know, increasingly clear that neither type 1 nor type 2 are monolithic um, diseases. And so, you know, we think that more research is needed to precisely understand the heterogeneity of diabetes pathophysiology and how to appropriately um, phenotype each person um, to inform optimal treatment approaches. Um, we also need to better understand both the biologic and psychologic drivers of behavior um, that may influence ability to adopt a healthy lifestyle. So this is above and beyond sort of the, the um, you know, economic or environmental barriers, um, and then to determine how best to implement patient-centered care, um, including the use of, of patient-reported outcomes 
um, in being able to develop optimal care strategies. So those were just what we here at NIH had identified as being um, research gaps that really needed attention um, in the context of what this commission is doing. Thank you, Barbara. I think that's, that's great. And I, I think as we go forward, we do need to carefully consider the research gap and all of our recommendations we want to be evidence-based, but I think if there isn't evidence, we should try to focus on what sort of research would help to fill those gaps. Are there any other hey. comments or discussion on a research agenda? Hey, Barbara, it's Ellen Leake again. Um, let me ask you about the All of Us program, um, because it seems that, uh, you know, we're trying to enroll a million people, and we're asking for information about health habits and you know, where they live. Uh, how do you see this fitting in our work as the commission? Will that, will the, will the results of that data gathering be too far off to affect our report in 2021? Any thoughts there? Well, I think the issue is that it's not really clear exactly what's going to be done, you know, in all of us. Um, so I think we're still not, it's still not clear um, you know, the, what information they're going to gather. And I think there's probably an intent that, um, you know, investigators will write applications to do additional research, either contacting those participants or using samples that are collected. I, I mean, I think it's potentially a resource. But, um, you know, we don't yet understand really how it's going to be used and what's going to be available from it. But it's a great okay. question. Thank you. And something, it's, it's a potential resource that for sure we should keep in mind. Bill, can I uh, ask a question? Is Dean Schillinger? Sure. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I wanted to ask, this is probably a question for the whole, whole group. Um, which is that the NIH traditionally has a specific scope uh, for the kinds of science um, it does um, uh, or it tends to support. Do you believe that the kinds of population health science needs that we discussed um, in the first presentation of the first subcommittee, the cross-agency work um, uh, exploring things like the built environment, the food environment, um, to be included, or are these are these are these initiatives that um, really we should be um, advocating that the CDC and the USDA and the Department of Transportation and, and all, all of these agencies uh, be, be doing um, be doing? I'm trying to understand the, the trans agency question and and where authority and history uh, kind of a, a line up. I, I I certainly know working with the CDC that. They have long wanted to have access to resources to study some of these questions, but haven't had access to it. You know, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily the person to be able to answer that question broadly because, you know, since I, I, I'm not familiar with the, you know, regulations that govern these other agencies, you know, that you're referring to, I think we're all trying to understand, you know, what the options are. Um, for cross-fertilization, um, for sure, I think that that's, you know, important. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing, you know, within NIH is, is that we are also trying to promote more pragmatic research, um, you know, that speaks more to, um, you know, understanding how to actually implement things in the real world um, r rather than in a, you know, sort of a, a a, 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 a traditional efficacy, you know, trial that um, may have so many inclusions and exclusions um, or provide so much research support that it's never, you know, doable in the real world. So I, I think that's an important um, area to focus on. And Dean, this is Bill. I, I attended a Centers for Diabetes Translational Research meeting. Yes in Washington on Wednesday and Thursday, which is an NIH Centers program. And it was attended by Will Cephalou, who's the new director of the Diabetes Institute. And there was strong support for research into 
uh, health disparities and social determinants of health. So I think this is on the uh, NIH research agenda. I think Barbara's point, though, I don't, I don't know what the Department of Transportation or the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I don't know if they support research per se, but I, I think, again, if we have strong recommendations to evaluate various interventions, uh, we could follow up with those agencies, find out what their missions are, and make recommendations for how to implement, evaluate various uh, uh, recommendations. Yeah, this is Ann Albright from CDC. Um, it, it is in our um, <coughs> purview to be doing research that is um, implementation, translation research, and I think this is where NIH and CDC do sort of share the work and then try to do a bit of the handoff. And so I think as we're examining um, to be sure that one is clear what is not duplicative but is coordinated or collaborative, because um, it, you know our role at CDC is to actually uh, study the ability to implement uh, interventions and then to work with others to scale those interventions. So there is that that uh, frame of research that is to some degree shared by NIH and CDC, but we certainly look to NIH to be doing more of that basic research. After all, those of us with diabetes need cures. And so, uh, you know, hopefully that's a, a big part of that portfolio. And then as we move to this translation work, that is a shared part of the research portfolio. And then CDC takes on their part and then works to implement. Any other comments on this? Can, can, Linda, can we go ahead to the next slide, Pat? So I, I, we, in about 10 minutes, we're going to need to shift gears and take uh, public comment. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, have a final discussion of the uh, the two models that we've uh, come up with and, and see if everyone agrees that these are adequate, if we're missing any uh, features, uh, or uh, whether we need to do anything more with respect to the models for our reporting. And I think there's been some suggestions in terms of uh, payment systems and benefit structure and things like that. But are there any other things that we've not discussed in terms of uh, how to develop the framework for our recommendations? So then do people feel that these two models are adequate and that we should be addressing all of the features that have been laid out in, the, in terms of trying to structure our recommendations. This is Naomi. Um, my perspective is that um, the social ecological model is actually more encompassing. And I do worry, I think a blend would be great, but I do worry about the um, side of the expanded care being too health system driven, that it would exclude, potentially exclude, um, the need to address issues of the environment. I think the intent is to include both in an integrated way. Oh, so it would be the blend, so it's full of two. Yes. So I don't think, I think if you blended both, then we wouldn't really have things that are missing. I thought I would it was agree with that. going one way or the other, so sorry. No, I think the intent is to blend. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and if anybody has a great graphics designer, let us know. And this is Phil Cook. I, uh, I think that you I could not really see anything that you'd miss by blending the, the two models. The, the um, expanded care model has the clear weakness that it's missing people that are outside of the health system. Um, if, if you applied that expanded care model to a, uh, to the whole country being covered under one system, if we had, you know, universal health care, it would be uh, a really, really good approach to things. Uh, but to Naomi's point, I think you'd still have to overlay the, um, the first model, the, the socio-ecologic model, to catch some of the environmental things that are missed by things that are payer 
space. So perhaps then access and appropriate utilization would be important to add to the expanded chronic care model. Yeah, it certainly is. Okay, right hand door is box. Of, as a, yeah, as a, uh, opening up Pandora's box to include our recommendations to get everybody covered in the United States. I don't know if that's what anybody's asking us, but um, then it has obviously all kinds of political implications and all, but it would, I think it would be easier to reach everybody from an access standpoint. Bill, I, I have a question, and as, as a health economist, I think you're in the best position to answer it, which is, um, do you believe the two models will enable us to ask the important questions related to the economic cost of of addressing the epidemic or the cost of not addressing the epidemic in certain is, is through certain pathways? Is it, do we have I guess is that is that an element of, of the research agenda? Yeah, I think that would be fascinating actually. And you threw out those numbers earlier that you know, 80% of the burden of illness can be understood in terms of some of the sociodemographic or uh, social factors and maybe 20% in terms of medical care with more related to medical care in, in people with diabetes. So I, you know, putting the models together, I think, would allow us to really evaluate the potential economic impact of interventions at levels from population level to high-tech interventions for people with established diabetes. I think it would be a great opportunity to foster more research in that area across the entire continuum. So if, this is Naomi again. So if we were to put this all into the context of the um, charge that we received, much of it would relate back to um, federal programs and finding ways to synchronize them such that we do become more economically viable, correct? Yeah, I think to take a global perspective would help yes. improve the efficiency of what we would call diabetes prevention and treatment. Right. Okay. Because I think personally that would be um, very helpful rather than having duplicative, um, you know, programs if part of the assessment and, and data call will allow us to determine, you know, some long existing programs that may not have been as effective as we had hoped they would be, in which case have the agencies uh, feel comfortable in sunsetting them or combining them, which, you know, does mean interagency collaboration and cooperation. But hopefully that's what we're headed towards. Yeah, I think we should keep that in mind. So, so I think we have a couple of minutes now, Linda, before um, the uh, public comment is that right and do we have some folks on the line who yes yeah, so Jennifer is going to um, take the can you do that Jennifer has the operator engaged the the two public commenters excuse me presenters no one has violating yet for the public comment so we have on the schedule, two people each with three minutes, so we'd like to give them another minute to get on the line and hear what they have to say. When they're done, I would like to go back and try to uh, summarize and, and wrap up some next steps. So um, I'll, I'll stop for now. We'll see if, if anyone calls in, uh, but, but hang on, everyone, uh, because we, we want to wrap up after this. Jennifer, any updates? Excuse me, speakers. Again, no one has dialed in yet for the public comment. Okay, shall we um, proceed then, assuming that no one is going to call in? Linda? Uh, 
Sure, I think we could go ahead, and if somebody calls in, we can let us let us know. Okay. Did they also uh, submit written um, documents for their comments? Uh, this is quite a. They're not required to submit written documents. They certainly do for the in-person meeting. I'm not aware. Jennifer would know. So this is Jennifer. Only one submitted a written, so we can. Um, they submitted it right before the meeting, so we can send that around. But only one did, not the other. Jennifer, this is quite it. I'm wondering if there was any confusion about the number to be called in. But you have a better sense of that than I do. No, they had a direct number to call, and they only had one number. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, so I, I'd like to have a discussion of uh, next steps at this point. And um, it, it sounds like we've uh, come up with a, a hybrid model that we like. And I think what we'll try to do is to put that together as a single model with the additions and uh, uh, variations that, that we've heard about. Um, I think we need to then also continue to work within the established subgroup. We will be getting data presumably from the data calls in two to three months. We have another meeting coming up in November, and I think what we could do most profitably until then is to work within the uh, subcommittees and try to put together information in the literature that pertains to the key focus areas. And there there have been a number of reports that have been circulated. Uh, there was the Lancet Commission report on diabetes that I think everyone has received. Um, there was a recent National Academies of Sciences report on non-medical health-related social needs, which I think is very germane. To the work of the uh, committee, and it just came out this spring, so it's very up to date. There's a NIH workshop on new research directions on disparities in obesity and type 2 diabetes. I think that that could be digested to help inform our work. And there's a lot of VA and Indian Health Service experience related to uh, the topics we've been discussing. And I know that NIH and CDC have supported a number of research studies, including Triad and the Next D study, that have looked at health system and provider and patient level uh, uh, factors affecting diabetes care and a number of natural experiments uh, looking at some of the domains in the socio-ecological model that I think we can be looking at. It, it would help if if others, I think, could uh, point to uh, either review articles or meta-analyses or uh, important publications related to the areas that we've laid out, and that we could perhaps divvy them up among the subcommittees and start trying to digest them. I would see all of that as a first step before we begin to solicit uh, original research, or we could certainly ask our uh, our colleagues uh, at the, uh, uh, the at, in the uh, office of the assistant secretary to help pull these things uh, together for us. But what sort of thoughts are there to that suggestion? Other suggestions? Uh, is this the way to move forward? So this is one. I'd also like to suggest that we, in the VHA, we care for about 1.6 million people with diabetes today, 70% to 55 and older. Um, it actually reflects to a large extent the U.S. population. Uh, many are healthy, but certainly we have a significant number with comorbid, comorbid conditions, mental health issues, <clears throat> economic disparities, student security. And I don't think that the um, literature reviews and and models can explain everything that we have to do today um, to provide better care. 
I think that a business model approach such as Harvard Review, business reviews, you need to go out into the community, uh, HMOs um, of the world, um, innovative state programs, uh, which might be close to us, to try to understand um, what's being done today uh, in these populations, um, similar populations, to improve the provision of care. Um, and there's also, uh, and that's not even the great literature, but that's basically trying to figure out where things might be successful. It's certainly not going to be the same quality of same quality, but in all honesty, randomized clinical trials um, don't get to the diversity and the challenges that we have. So, and I think, so I would suggest that in addition to the approach that you're taking, uh, that we also consider a more pragmatic approach is to try to understand what's going on today um, in our communities. Uh, HRSA, um, certainly HRSA, the Indian Health Service, and the VA, um, therefore very, a number of people who are doing very well. A lot of people who have many problems, uh, which probably well outweigh their diabetes issues. And so I just would ask the committee to reflect on that. So I think, you know, again, I think we're going to be getting information both from the data call as well as potentially from a review of the literature. I think some of that we will capture, I hope we would capture in the data call. And would that address your point, Len, or is there, is there more to it than that? No, no, it won't. If you're going to get information which is from the federal agency, but not all the information that we have um, reflects what we're already doing uh, and trying to get into place, um, which is just starting. And so the challenges we may have in, in starting up, and I'm now speaking within the VA, um, and how we're going to reach people, data will be a while to come. Um, for example, you know, connected care which in the private sector uh, isn't being implemented because of payment issues, or some of the issues we're trying to do with some novel approaches for education uh, that we're beginning to start up, for which we don't have data. And I don't think that's going to necessarily get data um, from the private sector who, is, who are not represented on the call. In other words, I think you're missing a, a this approach is going to get a significant amount of information um, which, quite frankly, is, is new and evolving or existing and we aren't aware of. So what I'm saying is do what you're doing, but I think it needs to be expanded to people not on the call to somehow reach out to systems uh, that are doing things that we aren't aware of. Yeah, so, uh, Bill, if I could maybe interpret, I think, Len, what you're suggesting is maybe some key informant interviews to enrich, to enrich our knowledge beyond the, the published literature and more getting at sort of the state of the art or the state of the state of the problem um, firsthand from some key informants. Yeah. So key informants in the government, key informants in the private sector, informants in the process of health. Yeah. So I, I think the idea of, yes, of soliciting input from outside experts, key informants, consultants would make sense. How should we approach that? Should we do that within the context of the subcommittee? Should we all brainstorm and try to generate lists of people that we should reach out to and, and assign them to? I think subcommittee work. I think that my approach, certainly within the, um, what the uh, limits of the NCCR and what the regulations are that I um, need to be established with the uh, uh, Linda, I, I think that a lot of it could be done at least within the governmental agency, um, within the NCCC by expanding um, for all the various committees to try to um, find out who within the federal agency, you know, could address their particular concerns. Um, and based upon that, uh, try to understand it, it, it's data, but it would be more qualitative data. Um, as to what's being done and what the challenges are, and, and data which is not yet published or not available from databases. Um, so I, I would think each of the subcommittees, at least as far as the governmental agencies, could uh, be connected with one another within the appropriate committees to try to brainstorm. Uh, so I don't know about the private sector. So, Len, I do think that that is within the most recently revised uh, 
data calls quite it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we do ask for contacts to provide insert names, phone numbers, email addresses to provide additional information. So I think we will get some of that, uh, but I so perhaps, uh, sorry, go ahead. I, perhaps each of the committees could come up with key topics that, um, key topics and we could start with those for brainstorming. Hi, this, this is Sherry Bowen. Uh, yeah, I think um, Len brings up a good point about also just um, who we're getting information from. And so I think you're right in the data call, we will have uh, some of that and then could expand upon that. And I think we've talked about that as a group. But I think the, the um, you know, the, I, I'm just reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, we have, for instance, state, stakeholders in Ohio, like the Chief Medical Officer of the Ohio Association of Community Health Centers, for example. Um, obviously, there's the National Association of Community Health Centers, um, and, and they would have a perspective that would be useful um, and see a high-volume Medicaid patient. So I, and then obviously, there's the, med, you know, people who are seeing Medicare patients. I think we have a lot of uh, connections on our NCC. I bet we could think of folks that might be good, um, and, and it might be useful to augment what we're doing with that. Hi, this is Jasmine. If I could say something real quick. I, I alluded to this on uh, previous communication, and I think it, it's real, relevant here that um, a lot of the national organizations have done a lot of the legwork for us in terms of scouring the literature and summarizing barriers and obstacles to optimization of care. And the the organizations that we're talking about, for example, one might be the Diabetes Advocacy Alliance, um, to where all of the national organizations have gotten together, put forth recommendations to say this would remove an obstacle, for example, to diabetes management. So um, I had previously thrown that out there, and I think it, it, it fits here in that reaching out to these other organizations could also color and frame um, our our recommendations as we move forward. I just want to I I'd like to thank you, Jasmine. That's that's a good point. I just want to remind the commission that we are evaluating federal programs. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to have the broader perspective of what what's out there in the community of practice that isn't federal, perhaps as a state of the art, or perhaps as a comparison or contrast. But let's keep our focus on what's happening specifically with um, sort of federal government and federal dollars. So, Clyde, does that not include this theory? So, does that not include Medicaid and, and Medicare patients as part of federal programs? It would include them, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I think, correct. yeah, I with with payment systems, benefit structure, Medicare, Medicaid. I I think that there may be some discrete non-federal programs, but I, I, I would agree with Jess, and I think we should reach out to AADE and ADA and JDRF and Endocrine Society and the Corey and other other agencies to get their their input as well. And I, and I guess I would propose to keep it from being too chaotic. It might make sense within the subcommittees for folks to try to come up with a list of organizations, agencies, uh, uh, individuals that they think would be informative and to put together lists and then maybe in a, a future call or even at the November meeting or perhaps before then try to try to prioritize uh, whose input we would want to solicit and in what format. So, so, Bill, this is uh, with respect to Medicaid uh, patients. I would certainly try to reach out to State Department of Health um, because they have you know, obviously Medicaid patients. I know of several. You know, we we through the um, the best practices, one of which is uh, Camden, New Jersey, uh, which is one of the poorest cities in the country, and they made uh, tremendous improvements in, in their population, just not diabetes, but hypertension um, and other issues simply by expanding hours because many of the individuals they serve um, uh, have day work and transportation problems. So, uh, you know, it's not a panacea, but sometimes perhaps simple solutions can yield some results. 
Um, so, again, I, I think there's information which is out there um, which needs to be looked at, um, and, and I do think it's consistent with the federal mission. Uh, in the VA, we pay for, we actually care for people, uh, but in other situations, it's the money goes out, and, and, you know, to look for a return on investment and what novel programs are out there that have been um, done through innovation. So, in other words, a wide net. I wouldn't discount anything if we're looking for improvement. And this, this state Medicaid waiver programs are very interesting. They're, they would be a lot of natural experiments, expanding benefits. Or exactly. Different things that we could look at to make recommendations for a more global implementation. I just to find out, I'd like to make um, another point just regarding the data call, um, just for clarity's sake. Um, number one, it has not yet gone out. It has still to be reviewed and approved by Don Wright and then sent up to the Assistant Secretary for his approval and then um, out by the Secretary, by Secretary Azar, out to the other HHS agencies. The question still remains about the non-HHS agencies other than USDA, DOD, and VA. And the Commission might want to be thinking, should that part of the data call not be able to go out, um, how you might also um, obtain that information? So let me put that question out to the subcommittee to start reflecting on now regarding alternative ways of getting the information you want about non-HHS federal agencies that are not providing clinical care. So, Clydeth, this is Dean Schillinger. Thank you for raising that. I wanted to raise it, albeit in a different way, but I'm, I'm glad you raised it as you did, which is just as we need uh, the evidence around, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work from the published literature, we also need an understanding, and I, and I understand this is also part of the pushback um, that Don has been um, uh, giving us around what programs within agencies are of potential relevance to the diabetes epidemic. And, um, you know, we are more familiar with the scientific and clinical evidence around the care of diabetes than we are around understanding how, how agencies are structured, what programs they have that could be leveraged. And so for me, the, the data needs that our subcommittee um, really requires is an understanding of the basic architecture uh, and functions of the agencies in order to best target any inquiry that we might want to make, um, leaving aside Anne Albright's excellent point about whether, you know, where they have regulatory authority and where they don't. So I, I feel we need some basic education. Um, uh, insofar as some of these agencies are going to have the key word diabetes in their program, we need some basic education or information somehow uh, as to um, the relevant programs within agencies. And I would like, this is Bill again, I, I think ideally we would prospectively assess that we might want to write a preamble to our non-questionnaire specifically laying out that, what it is we are interested from them. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not necessarily suggesting that it needs to be part of the data call, because that may be, may be problematic. Uh, there may be other ways of getting the information on what the relevant programs are through either passive or active means. I, I, I just don't know. Well, yeah. an, an, alternative, an alternative approach would be to do this literature review and see how transportation is important in terms of uh, disparities and, and health care prevention of diabetes, and then go back to the Department of Transportation and ask for specific information about programs that could target uh, the areas that were identified. Hi, this is Kaidette. I just want to uh, make a clarification again. Um, one of the concerns that Don Wright has had is that uh, perhaps uh, a formal inquiry like the data call to non-HHS agencies that are not specifically mentioned in the charter might be too broad a reach or too broad a scope. And so I, I think it's good to hear this discussion about how the Commission might consider 
getting that kind of information outside of the more formal data call. So, you know, we're glad to work with you. I, in some respects, it's a learning curve for us as well. But if we can continue in dialogue and um, recognize that our information um, method or our methodology might not be through the official data call, um, but we, we could still achieve our objectives, especially uh, regarding the prevention of the general population. So again, if it's not a prospective data call, then I think we should plan to go back to the uh, other federal agencies and ask them for specific information at some point after we've learned more about their their regulations, programs, policies. Yes, I think that, that might work. We have uh, begun a list of some of the programs and activities within those departments. I think uh, we'll have to do a little more research to understand that uh, relationship to the prevention of the general population. All right, well, so moving forward, can I then ask the subcommittees to both identify key publications or reports that they think are relevant to their focus areas and would inform the, the science and also to generate lists of outside experts, key informants, uh, organizations, state uh, uh, level folks uh, who they think it would be worth uh, soliciting input from and putting them together for review by the, the, the entire commission. Does that sound like a reasonable next step? Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. This is Dean Schillinger again. I'm wondering if it's perhaps a little bit under ambitious. I mean, I, I, there may be opportunities for us to interview key stakeholders or experts between now and then to kind of get us at least, you know, a skeleton of the kinds of things we we might be considering uh, synthesizing into um, recommendations. What, what do folks think? Shall we empower the subcommittees to reach out and start talking to these folks, or do we want to generate a list, or after the fact just keep a list of people who are contacted and the input that they provide? This is Terry Bolin. I think it would be fine to reach out. I think the only uh, thing we want to do is um, be coordinated. Like, you don't want every subcommittee to have reached out to the same person. I'm sure that people might find that annoying. Um, so I just throw that out there in terms of coordination. So how would you coordinate it, Terry? Well, I think we should get a list um, and put it together. Of pe if people are thinking of contacting someone, I think we should put together those lists first and then have a coordinated outreach if we're going to have multiple committees reaching out to someone. So, so Dean, if we did that in the next uh, two or three weeks, generated lists of potential key informants, uh, and then shared the lists and then divvied them up to do some of the work before the November meeting, would that uh, address your concern? Absolutely, yeah. No, I just wanted to have the opportunity to get a little bit of the ball rolling. Because I think it will be important fodder for this. I mean, I don't know what the agenda for the November meeting uh, exactly is, but I think it would be it would enrich the content of the meeting to have some something tangible. Good. So this is Carol. this is Carol. I also think that we'll build on that, and that will. From there, we may find other things, and it may direct us more. So I agree with Dean and Dean's approach. Good. And what would be a, a timeline to assemble a initial list of uh, of key informants and uh, to to review and then divvy up? Three weeks, a month, two weeks. I would push us to do two to three weeks. Okay, so 
so let's say three weeks by the middle of October, and then we can ask people to start reaching out uh, uh, to these individuals or organizations. So I just want to be sure I understand. I think Jerry, like if everybody wanted to call the same person in the Department of Transportation or in the USDA or something, we would want to do it together, not three separate calls. But otherwise, can't we, can our subcommittees call the people that we think are going to inform our priorities? Or when you say divvy up, what are you meaning? Well, so I, I don't think we should be calling the uh, HHS or, or non-federal agencies until we have some uh, clarity on whether the data call is going to go out. Well, okay, that's a bad example. I'm just saying, I think Sherry meant that everybody didn't call the same right. person separately. Yeah. So I, I think the suggestion <laughs> was within three weeks to generate, to have everyone develop a list of key informants, contacts, consultants, voluntary organizations, and maybe ask Linda then to put that together and then assign which subcommittee would reach out to those individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think the subcommittees will be submitting the list, so it'll be pretty clear who should be calling. It's in the area of the overlap where there'll be the opportunity to be on the call together or... Right, so to look for the overlap and to clarify who's calling home. Well, this is Linda. Yeah. What I would like to propose is that we have a meeting of the co-leads of the subcommittees to work this out. Yeah. But for the entire membership of the NCCC, I think it would be good to start thinking about individuals and organizations outside of the agencies that we're dealing with that you might want to reach out to who you think could have uh, useful information for the commission. Yeah, so and Bill, if, if we're collating a list, sorry, Mr. Secretary, I was just saying if we're collating a list, you could have a column for each, uh, you know, either a column stating who mentioned the person and or, and or their subcommittee so that when you're meeting to look at who's going to be on a call, it, it'll be more clear if it needs to be, you know, more than one person. Yeah, I think I, that makes good sense. And maybe, Linda, you could come up with a template that folks could use. This is quite it. I just need a point of clarification for information flow. So, Bill, are you suggesting that all the commission members be thinking about these key informants, that they then provide that information to their co-chairs of their respective subcommittees, and then the co-chairs provide that to Linda, who who would collate that. Is that what you're proposing? Exactly. Does that seem reasonable to others, or would you have a modification of that? No, I think my sense of that, that might work best. So on our side, what we would need to do is maybe a, a mock-up table so that we know how to maybe have co-chairs po populate a table that's all, a dummy table in a sense. That would say the name of the person, the agency or entity they represent, um, their email, phone number, and the person who has either proposed that or who has who knows that person, et cetera, so that we avoid the duplication and we know the source of that um, that name. Yes. Would, would that help us be organized? Is what I'm saying. I think so. That. Does that seem reasonable to everyone? Definitely. Okay. The other thing that uh, I was hoping and expecting that we could do to help jumpstart organizing by the models is to, uh, first step, just use them to create a checklist. Um, so this might be helpful in this exercise as well, just to get started. To see if we're covering all of the issues um, from both of the models. And then in parallel to that, I believe that the work of these subcommittees can be working on blending them so that there's um, sort of a unified, synergistic view of the model that you all are going to develop. Well, so I would like to see you perhaps 
develop a model that integrates the two models that we've discussed and the additional features that were not covered, and then we could review that to see if it covers all of the focus areas we've identified. Right. It seems to me that that is the work that some of the work that the committees can be doing. Or that, that, that Linda, you could be doing, I think. I can do a first cut at the, um, the items, the, the issues in these two models, and we can include in the discussion today the, uh, the topics that we think weren't included. Yeah, and, and perhaps Dean and Ann uh, Bullock can advise you on that. Yeah. Good. I think we need advice from each of the uh, uh, subcommittees. I don't want to call short the, the work of especially the treatment um, and complications group because they are really going to need to weigh in on the issues around the system, uh, the, the expanded care model, and, and looking inside the the healthcare delivery system. I guess the second, um, the, uh, the prevention and targeted uh, populations as well. So we can put something together as a like a draft, and then have the subcommittee chairs look at that. How does that sound? Great. It sounds then, like just try that again. It sounds like there are two sort of little products. One is this blended model. And the second is some kind of, I don't know, spreadsheet to capture the information on the key informant. Is that correct? And the third piece that I would like to see is the important articles or reports that would inform the work of the various subcommittees. So again, I'd like to see everyone in the NCC poll articles related to recent reviews on social determinants of health or health disparities or whatever, like the Lancet Commission report or the National Academies of Sciences report that we can put together as a resource list uh, for the subcommittee members to review. And Carol, that would apply then also to really important works in terms of treatment and treatment and complications, not just uh, obviously social determinants. And Bill, again, this is Claudette. Um, I mean, the timeline for each of those three products. Are you looking to have the articles, the spreadsheet, and the blended model within two three weeks? What about yeah, I, I was thinking well, this was October. Can right someone now. help us do a lip search or are we just to do this all on our own? I mean I don't I don't have great resources where I live, so um are do we get any assistance finding these articles? Like some um, people can help us. Um well, Liz, I, there is a uh, an intern working with Linda and Clyde Ed, is that right? Yeah, I was, yeah Bill, this is Clyde Ed. I was just going to say that um, Jasmine Gonzalvo, Erica, Kim, and I have had, I think now, a couple of phone calls regarding a systematic review. What we would need, however, from the various subcommittees is some focused um, questions so yeah. that the systematic review can uh, Use those to springboard into the actual search. So, so I, but if this is Bill, I, I don't think we want to be doing a systematic review. I think we want to be pulling articles relevant to the the areas that we've identified as the focus areas. Yeah, this is Terry Bolin, uh, and and I I started a course for systematic reviews and meta analyses here at Case, and have a, over ten years of experience with them. I mean, they take a long time. I know a lot of people on this committee have done them. I'd be concerned about uh, starting that kind of process uh, in a, if we really think of a systematic review, which usually takes one to two years. Um, so I, I would I would be very hesitant to do that. I think uh, what Bill is suggesting is more appropriate. So then, thank you, Sherry. I appreciate that perspective. Um, Jasmine, do you want to 
comment, weigh in on that? Sure. I, I think there's a little bit of context um, behind the discussions that we've had in terms of Erica's position as a fellow and having a long-term project. That said, I don't disagree with the comments that have just been proposed in terms of a systematic review is really intense and we need information more acutely in the short term to inform the recommendations as we move forward. So the context being that um, Erica being a fellow is learning and this was kind of a project that she could also undertake. So um, that said, I think our needs are a little bit different for um, the idea that we're gathering information that's informing our recommendations. So I, I think that they could technically be separate entities. I also don't think that it's out of the realm of the possibility that Erica could also be accomplishing both that she could also be finding very specific literature for us um, while also working on a longer-term formal systematic review. Thank you, Jeff. And then my question, too, is I wonder if there are already some professional societies that have pulled together some of these um, sets of literature on some of, at least some of our focus topics uh, so that the... Um, and Fast forward to what's being asked by the chair. So, I mean, we could also ask a research librarian if we had keywords or types of studies to pull these things. I think many of us working in the field already know about good review articles or uh, uh, meta analyses or things that have looked at these. I don't, I don't think it would be that hard. To do it, and and again, I Jess and I respect what you're saying and understand the need to have the intern have a project, but we have very very limited support for the work of the commission, and um, I, I'm just concerned about undertaking a, a a systematic review at any level. Um, so if that's part of her job description or 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 work. I guess I would reconsider that, but we're spread pretty thin as it is. So, this is Linda. Would it be helpful if Erica took the um, the reviews like the Lancet and began to do a synthesis and a crosswalk of that with the issues that the commission wants to cover? What do people think? Could you repeat the statement? What I'm asking is um, whether it would be helpful to have Erica take uh, the review articles, you all could give her a list of the review articles, and I'm just thinking of the Lancet one, and again do a systematic analysis of what's in there that could be used by the commission in making your, uh, you know, exploring the different uh, issues that you want to uh, explore, your top, your your um, priority areas, and and um, the development of recommendations. Yeah, I think I think if we can identify some key studies, manuscripts, articles, reviews, etc., and uh, have have your central team synthesize them into meaningful documents, that would be a tremendous help and probably a, a, a better use of of your guys' skill set. So I, I think we need to be wrapping up. So the three deliverables in the next three weeks or so would be uh, important articles, uh, the the list of key informants, and trying to uh, rework the two models into one. And then the idea would be to, to move forward with uh, perhaps contacting key informants between the middle of next month and the November meeting. So what we can do, this is Linda, is put what you just described into a timeline and uh, send that around to, to send it to you for your review, Bill, and then the the, um, the subcommittee shares in the next week. Good. And Linda, did you want to wrap up now? I would love to wrap up with an announcement about uh, our next meeting, which is happening in November, November 21st and 22nd, and that's an in-person meeting, and we look 
look forward to seeing you all in person there. Hi, this is Fidel. I just want to add to that. Uh, that meeting will be, day one will be an afternoon meeting uh, of subcommittees. Day two is the full commission meeting, and it will be held at the same hotel where we had our last in-person meeting. I would encourage people to be in contact with Christine Hall if you are non-fed. Uh, Christine Hall is the travel arranger with whom you have worked in the past. And I'd, I'd just like to, to say a few words as a Dean Schillinger. Um, first of all, formally welcoming Linda. I know we've had a number of phone calls uh, already, but I think, Linda, this is the first, is it the first call with the entire commission for you? Oh, I attended the, the meeting in June. And I, you were there in June. I wasn't. Okay. No. Well, great to have you, and we get to, get to still have Clydette, so we get we get the best of both. That's where a tag team. <laughs> right. And at the June meeting, Linda was, was in an observer status. She's now uh, has the DFO training and is your go-to person for the kinds of uh, administrative things that I have been hearing. So, yeah, you know me by all of the emails <laughs> that you've been getting from me, but I'm really looking forward to put facing, uh, faces to um, what I have just been emailing. Great. Okay, well... Thank you, everyone, very much. I think it's been a productive meeting. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all.